all right, I guess we can go ahead and kind of get started here. I gave you a paper copy here uh, as a good reference. Um, again, I made this presentation. There's going to be a lot on some of these slides, but this is more supposed to be a reference for you to go back on and look at, and I'll try to get a mixture of everybody gets a PDF copy who wants one. But like, hopefully this is a good reference for you in decision making. Now I'm here to, uh, I'm Mark Bashir from Johnson County Central, and I'm talking about equipment here, and uh, specifically like the cameras and communication setup stuff. But I'm not gonna be like, hey, we need to buy this certain camera, or hey, you're looking for, you know, a, um, a specific lens or anything specific. Like I get kind of specific on some of these slides. My goal here is to kind of educate you on what some of that stuff means so you can make the best decision based off of a whole bunch of other things, based off of your gyms, based off of your budget, based off your, your what your kids are trying to do project-wise, that then you can help balance all those variables and you have more knowledge about all the different types of cameras that are best suited for you. So we'll just start out here, and of course it's gonna work here. Um, so we'll start with uh, what cameras that we actually use at JCC, uh, then we'll go into the, the crew communication that goes along with that, and then uh, um, some example of how we set up our equipment in terms of camera locations and stuff like that. <coughs> this past year we upgraded to the Canon XF605 cameras. Uh, these are definitely on the high end uh, camera wise, but um, it was just a good combination of all the things I just talked about why we decided to go at this level of camera. But the four whys I'm gonna highlight are, or in your decision making on your cameras are brand name, your zoom reach, image quality low light, and ports and IO. Now there's some things we don't talk about here. One of them is like based off of your projects, what type of projects are you making? How does that align with um, what, what gear you currently have or what gear you're wanting? This is gonna be really quick. Choosing the brand, I say stick with the major brands. So if it's like, um, you don't want to go with like a, uh, I can't even give you an example of, but like a, one of those small companies that you, that you don't know anything about. Uh, I'm going to talk about video cameras. You will have different options that you could go away from a video camera, but whenever you're thinking video camera, that's with the lens built in. That's not an interchangeable lens. And then once you get to a brand, I highly suggest stick with that brand you're gonna be able to um, have more familiarity with all the menus of how it operates. It's easier to match white balance and you get to share batteries. So like, I don't know how many of you guys have ever used your battery only for a live stream. But like now that we got these new cameras, I, <coughs> I would say almost every concert we streamed this year was only on battery. And it's not a real big deal, but it saves on setup. <coughs> Zoom. Okay, here is going to be a lot of information here, but like um, the biggest uh, question I always have for our live stream is, do we have enough Zoom for it? I recommend a minimum of 15 uh, times optical Zoom. Um, if you can't get a 20 time optical Zoom, that's great. The 605 is only 15 though. Um, optical Zoom is what's literally going to be on your hardware of your lens, so that's going to be your best quality. You do have digital zoom, which uh, is more uh, just the camera itself zooming in on that image. But the benefit about getting that zoom is that you get a, this is from across, the, this is a football field shot on our live stream, and that's as tight as we're able to get uh, with good zoom range. So zoom is going to be especially important. That bottom line is on the multi cam setup. If this is a one camera stream for football, there's probably gonna be a no way I'd ever tell our person to zoom in that far, right? That would be, that'd be you a lot. zoom back out. Um, yeah, yeah, zoom back out. Now my background is in still photography, and I'm gonna show you kind of comparison of like what all the millimeter lenses go. So if we go back to the slide, um, the really cool part, uh, these are all video cameras up in the corner. You have the, the 20 times optical zoom, but then you have the 35 millimeter equivalent. So like on the XF605, the 35 millimeter equivalent is 25.5 and 382 millimeters. A 
and that's the range of that wind. And without, if you don't, if you're not familiar with that, this is what that shows. So like this is the XF605, and it can, it's going from 25 millimeters all the way zoomed in to 382. Versus a film camera, that's in the, that's a, like a 70 to 200 is what I use for basketball all the time. That's without ranges. The big football cameras you see on the sideline are 400 prime. That's only right here, but your video cameras can do all this whole range. Now this is gonna be nothing new because all of your video cameras have a big range like that. <coughs> but as technology gets better and you have the 20% optical zoom, this white bar is gonna get longer and longer and longer. And that's gonna really benefit you on multi-cam streaming, um, any concerts you're doing, um, not necessarily like height videos, but uh, like I guess height videos for football, having that zoom range is gonna be really good because if that, if that runner is going from the 15 yard line running up the sideline and they're only this far away from you and then they go on and score a touchdown, you could be zooming in and out and following them the whole way. So I thought this was kind of a good chart to kind of show why that zoom is so good. The next there's a couple of examples of what the zoom will do for you. So we play eight man football right now. This is what a pre-snap image would look like. So this is your more of a wider shot. And then after the play gets done, we would follow the ball and then we would switch to a tight shot. <coughs> I should I wanted to put a map view on here, but I didn't know if it was really going to be help, that helpful. Uh, just how far back we are. We're, we're playing eight-man football, we're on an 11-man field, we have a track, then there's concrete, the bleachers, more concrete, and then the press box. So we're pretty far away. Um, here's an example of tight shots that you can do, um, and this is in volleyball. So uh, we're, a half, we're a half body shots, and I know it might be kind of hard to see the lighting here, but that image is nice and crisp. If you have a older video camera, you might be hopping into your optical zoom and this image quality will start to go down a lot. <coughs> so those are the three volleyball shots that you can get by, that's one advantage of a video camera versus a DSLR. There are some advantages of doing the DSLR stuff, but for us, having that zoom range is really important. Um, the second quality that I think is really important in determining the camera is your low light and image quality here. So this is where we're kind of getting really technical. The big thing here is the sensor size. So the sensor size is listed here uh, for just four models of cameras. And um, the bigger, the better. So like the G40, which is what we used to have, is um, one over 2.84 inches sensor, so that's that's pretty small versus like the 605 and the XA75 are both one inch sensors. So that's just the amount of light it can take in. So um, <clears throat> if you notice that your football streams are getting pretty grainy or you know don't look the best, or if your gym lighting is still from the 60s, um, your low light is gonna be important. If you really want to get in the weeds, uh, there's two other camera uh, values, the minimum light illumination and sensitivity. Actually kind of gets in that detail. If you really are interested in the technical values, this is actually straight from Axis, who does all security cameras. And of course, so security cameras are really important on low light, because how many times you see a security camera and you can't tell what's going on because it's too dark. So this is talking about those measurements of uh, what that means, because it's a, basically a signal to noise ratio is what it is. So if you want to dive into deep, you can do that. But like that, if you're wondering like, why is this camera $1,000 more than this other camera? It has the same zoom range, it has the same ports, it has the same screen size, it could just be this, this image sensor. Similar to the like uh, full frame cameras versus crop sensor cameras, but if anyone's in photo, into photo cameras, that's what that kind of is too. Um, so this is just an example and it's kind of apples versus oranges, but this is uh, from 2015 when we started in 2022, same football field lights. Um, this is about the same part of the field we're at. 
Uh, but we can control our exposure and um, bump up that gain a lot on our current cameras compared to our old ones. So you can see much better after sunset. Uh, just in terms of screen quality, now this is also, these are not original camera files. These are still just uh, from our uh, Wirecast recordings. But um, as being hard to see here, there's kind of a difference in image quality already in terms of how sharp that really is here. Same shot, just zoomed in, so um, image quality wise. Ports, this is where I'm going to really try to kind of go over this really quickly because I didn't want to. You know, we could go over a whole bunch of technical stuff, but most of your cameras that you're going to be picking from are going to have the HDMI. Um, they're going to have the remote uh, the, uh, for your zoom controller part. They're going to have those ports. Those are pretty much. If you don't have that, they should not be, they're not going to ever be on any of our lists to buy. Uh, the other ports that we're looking for are SDI. Again, the benefit for SDI for us is I can have my camera right there and our computer right here, and I don't have to worry about a cable. If SDI can go up to 300 feet, I think it is. So we have a different, I have like a 75 footer that we carry a lot. I have a spool, that's the 300 foot that we use once in a while, but um, we moved everything to SDI. Again, if you are looking to jump into multi-cam, like when you go to make the big jump in, that's when you want to make, maybe make, uh, look at that. SDI will come in when we get to the next slides later on about where we're setting up cameras as well. Battery life, um, actually this is something I haven't even talked to Jordan about yet, but like, yeah, we start. We have started streaming on batteries a lot, and it just by the time you get everything set up and have to do setup and get. I mean, we can do one less power strip. It's all all. It's a lot less setup if we're running on batteries. Um, it's easier to do projects if your batteries can last more than 20 minutes. So like, our bat. I think our battery, our smallest batteries, can do more than three hours. Ooh. So. Our big one, I think, is over 500 minutes, which is whatever that is. It's a lot. Yeah. Uh, then having all the cameras are nice, depending on what you want, but uh, crew communication is very important. So the the real we'll talk about it here, but the real thing is more of just having practice with somebody who's done it before, because yes. Um, I can give you all the tools, but if they're not talking about the things that they should be talking about, you're, you're, may, you're not maybe gaining the advantage of having true communication. So it's kind of hard to see here. Um, there, I have two different examples here. This one's between the camera switcher, and I know terminology, different people different, use different things. The camera switcher is talking with the camera on operators on this section, and then the person running the wirecast computer is talking more to the camera switcher and camera ops on that this section. The ones in bold are more the people who are the ones quote unquote talking. So in communication, this is what I, I think are the main things that they're talking about. Yes, I might be talking to Jeremy about what my dog did or what I'm gonna be doing after the stream, but I need to be talking about this. So this is switching camera views is this main switcher job. So they're communicating and directing your camera operations. And I kind of split this up into two groups. The first one is just telling the cameras uh, when to move, when their shot is on the live stream, and then if they have any adjustments in terms of framing, um, in terms of making sure that they're on the right person. Because if um, Rob hit the basket, but they're on Jeremy, that camera switcher is probably going to be the one who needs to tell them, no, you're on the wrong person, we need to go to Rob. We also, like we literally have, like, if we're waiting before a uh, concert typically, we literally have exercises where um, I tell a kid to pick somebody in the crowd, and then I would say like, okay, I've seen somebody with a hat. And then the other people in the group will have to describe where that person is, so that I, I can't just say that white hat is over there. No, I have to be like, left side of the room, second row, second guy in. It's descriptions like that. because the, And the goal of that is that then when it comes to the live stream, they're not saying, oh, go to that guy over there. Or go to that, the, the kid in black shirt and you, they have no idea who you're talking about. 
And so it's developing those skills and ter common terminology. And we're doing this as a group too, so they get used to how each other describes things, that then it's easier for your crew to communicate to staff to get to that right, the correct person right away. Um, the more advanced um, methods of this communication is uh, you're able to hide the camera movement. So if you're on the wrong person, instead of, like, <laughs> instead of watching that camera move from Jeremy to Rob and they're herky-jerky to get there, or if I'm going from this corner of the room, Taylor back there, that you don't see that on your multi-cam switching, that, that communication, um, you're not just dependent on that switcher if you have good communication to hide that. Um, the other thing on the communication is setting up shots relevant to the commentary and game flow. So that, what that means is that uh, at the beginning of your game, you might be talking about your star players, you might be talking about the coaches. So I think it's fairly um, recognizable if you were the guy is sitting up for streaming for a basketball game, if there's a bench here and a bench there, where are you going to find the head coaches? You know, one's going to be over on this bench and one's going to be over on that bench. But for somebody who's never watched basketball, they, have, they may not have any clue. It also is good for them to communicate ahead of time. The head coach is the one that's wearing a black polo. Or the star player is actually number 32, so go find number 32. Um, that, and that's all pre-game chatter that could be happening with your crew ahead of time. The game flow is, I was talking about what are our opening three shots when they go live. So typically what are also the opening shots? We're establishing where we are. So I don't want a close up on Hoosier to start a stream necessarily. I might want a wider shot of the whole room that shows where we're at. And that shot could be a static shot, that could be a slow pan. So um, establishing where we're at, establishing who's playing, uh, establishing uh, what's most important to the game. So like, we, since we started Shrive, we've had two incredibly amazing fog games. And so we want to highlight that. So uh, if, you're, if you went to a commercial, I, sometimes people just pull out their phones right away, right? If we're having good communi crew communication, we should be talking about what are we showing when we're coming back from commercial? What was something that was just relevant to what happened in the game? Um, for those fog games, we showed a nice big wide shot that's painting the whole football stadium to see that you could literally see the fog rolling in and the fog was only about 80 foot tall and it was like the last like, 80 feet of ground is what was covered in fog. Um, so that again is more switcher and camera ops communication. If we go over to Wirecast and um, this Wirecast is more of what I would, like the producer that's making all the final decisions. They're basically doing any transitions in and out of breaks, graphics, timeouts, anytime you're taking a break. They're, uh, technically, these guys are also communicating with, um, they need to make sure they're communicating with the commentators, but they may not be on crew communication. So the basic is communicating to the whole crew of when timeouts occur, when commercials are coming, both in and out. And um, if you don't want to switch to the camera, um, like, well, okay. For example, why this is important. You don't want to necessarily switch to your secondary camera and then have it on the screen for like a half a second right before the commercial hits. So you're, uh, what I like to do is try to establish a pattern. And that means, okay, after that, if they score a touchdown and they kick the PAT, we're going to commercial right away. You can't just sit there for 45 seconds chatting and then want to send a commercial because then you won't get back in time for kickoff. You also want to make sure everybody's on the same page for that so then your switcher is not switching right as that camera occurs. Not really a big deal, but when you're talking about production, I don't want to switch to uh, a shot of uh, the away team and then I'm going to go switch to a shot of the home team and it only shows up there for half a second and then we're on a commercial. So that's what the wirecast person has to make sure they do it. I know there's a lot of different hand signals, uh, but uh, uh, this is our kind of a universal signal for the note we're saying here, keep it going, just keep going. And then we hold up a stop sign or break or break, break. All those are kind of universal signals that uh, we use. Uh, of course, I can audibly be saying that too for the people who are all on the same microphone. 
Um, but that's the, that is only the basic part. The other thing is, like we talked about the fog stuff, that can also be more of like, maybe your more experienced person is your wire cast person that can help direct more. So finding creative and establishing shots, intros and, out, and outros out of break. That can be kind of helped by this person, especially if you have graphics to be showing at the same time. So like we have a graphic that is just like a little lower third about right here that comes up. <coughs> Everybody on that crew needs to know that that's coming up so they don't frame a shot that like the most important thing is hidden right behind that graphic. And that's why this person needs to be involved, the Wirecast person needs to be involved with that type of communication. Uh, same thing for highlighting players and coaches if you have on-screen graphics for that. Um, and. Um, I don't know why I put that there. So like this person also can kind of give a good view because they've only seen the program feed. Uh, they can be helping provide the switcher uh, good reminders of what we've seen and what we haven't seen. Because sometimes as a switcher, uh, you can kind of get inundated by you, you might know that that camera has been on that one really cool thing four or five times, but we still haven't seen it yet because it never got taken live, right? So. That's what this is kind of here for, I think, in my opinion, was that that person running Wirecast should be able to kind of help with that type of communication because they've seen what's been on the stream. Uh, kind of highlighted this before, but before um, it's establishing keywords, especially, so we see this a lot at state. Uh, if a switcher is with camera operators that have never worked for, with before, their definition of what a wide shot, high shot, medium shot, that could all be slightly different. So I like to make sure that they know what words they're using, how they say, um, like how they identify people. Are they saying wide camera, tight camera, camera one, camera two? Are they using names? I don't like to use names. I think names are tougher to recall really quickly. If your, your camera operators have switched positions between games, then you're now have to read. If you're the switcher, you have to rethink those. So I like to use terms that are literally describing what you're seeing. So tight, wide, camera one, camera two. Um, knock that all out before the stream starts. And this is like what you could literally talk about at class too. Uh, during the stream, what communication should happen is um, letting cameras know before their shot goes live. You can't just be like, "And I'm on camera two now," because if that camera two is not quite ready, whether they're just readjusting their feet and they're, they're not quite set, um, or their arm is just uh, cramped right in the wrong position and they have to like, jerk a little bit to get their, their shot nice and steady. Uh, it should be like um, uh, ready camera two, taking camera two. So you know which camera is coming up next. If you're only doing two cameras, that's not a big deal because they know Either they're on live or they're coming up next. If you get past two, if you get to three or four cameras, then it's really important to know, let that person know that they are gonna be going live. If you get a four camera, a remote, remote, remote camera, I highly recommend for the switcher, I don't have it on here, is that when you say we're going to four camera, we're on four camera now, is that every couple seconds be like, we're still on four camera, we're still on four camera, we're still on four camera. And then your floor camera operator will be able to tell you, hey man, my, my arms are killing me here. Or, or I have a ref true, like, chatting in my ear that I need to move or something like that. And they can tell you when they get off. Well, the worst part is if you're running that floor camera, they say you're on cam on, they're on me, and I'm, and I'm worried about this shot, I'm trying to get a close up of this player, and I'm worried about all the things around me like they should be. And then I can't remember if they're still on me or not. Now, if you're, the floor camera operator is a good one, they will ask, hey, are you still on me? If they're not as experienced, they might just get tired and they just might just walk back. And now, you have a, now on the stream, you have a video of the floor, right? So uh, that's like the example of the communication that I, I like is constantly reiterating um, that they're, whatever camera you're on, you're on. Uh, during breaks, the switcher, wirecast should all be able to help count people back in. So, um, normally for our setup, switcher and wirecast 
has some sort of communication. The person running Wirecast may be not always able to talk to the camera people. If that's the case, the switcher needs to be uh, saying back what they're hearing from Wirecast. So Wirecast will tell 15 seconds. Switcher says 15 seconds. We'll say 10, they need to say 10, and then count them back in until we're live. So everybody should know. And then for if you for commentators, I use hand signals. 10 seconds. This is this is 15 for me because I don't want to do it. So 15, 10, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. I kind of tell them to hold because depending on who's running wirecast, they might take an extra half a second to clear that layer and then bring back the audio. And then once they're ready, then I go, now go, now you're good to talk. Um in terms of equipment, in terms of what we use for career communication, uh, yes, you can get fancy stuff, but we literally started with a, uh, our old USB audio board, and all we had to buy was just headsets. Every kid had their own headset. Um, when we talk about student engagement, this was my number one way to keep kids engaged on a stream, is putting everybody on a headset so they could hear and talk to the other people. Because again, basketball games, if you're sitting that far apart, it might be kind of hard to hear, and you just kind of get used to this kind of zoning in the game, right? By giving everybody a headset, yes, they might be a little distracted here, but like, it doesn't take any fancy equipment. For years, this is how we ran it. Um, this was our modified version of that same thing, but it was rack mount. So it was just a lot set up for us, because now instead of four power cables, I was down to one. Um, but this is our current setup and layout. So this is where we started. That's where we, when we just expanded to uh, multi-cam over here. So we weren't on the same level. Our, you can see here, this is where we had set up wirecast switcher, commentators, computer, uh, cameras. Everybody could still communicate. This is where <laughs> we're currently set up. So it's pretty much the same. If I probably would build a new gym, I like to have everybody on the same row again. That's good for communication. Um, this is Abnidecus, pretty much the opposite view of what we just saw in our gym. The only thing is, is we kind of have it already over here. I think if I could do this different, I would move camera two over here, move switcher down, and move wirecast right by commentators. I, I typically like to have wirecast close to the commentators. If possible, I'd like to have a switcher next to the Wirecast, so. Uh, here's ECNC at SEC. So pretty much the same thing, except we've moved away everything from half port over to here. So um, this is where SCI cables come in handy because we can go these longer distances. This is also what this looks like just from a graphical view. So um, all it needs to take, this is what we used to run, is SDI. If you're doing crew communication, hardwired, it took, it took more cables because we had to have an XLR cable, a half port, one for microphone, another one for their ear, and then we had to run one all the way down to the tight camera. Now that we have, if you go wireless communication, you can get rid of both of those XLR cables. And so now for this, all we have to do is run power to the half port, because there's no power in the middle, and then an SDI cable to each camera. Yes. Did you man camera three? Yes. For most of those? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If we had space, this is probably how I'd run most of our games, especially if you got instant replay. But like if we go back to this, uh, uh, I mean, that is multi cam switching does not have to be that complicated. It can just be this. Literally, the two cameras are side by side. That's how we run it on our home games. That's, you know, you don't need wireless headsets to do that. Um, this is just another view of the equipment, but this gives you a view of the audio board that we were running at that time before wireless headsets. Again, just another view of what this looks like in a different gym. We put our main cable in the corner with uh, our switcher and wirecast, camera there, camera mid court, far camera. Now, you don't have to man that far camera if you don't have enough people, but I like having those tight shots. I, mean, I didn't do it on this presentation, but we can kind of go into when you're using each of those tight shots to get in a pattern. So again, this is just good for reference of how this is laid out. 
Um, yeah. Once you get to that many tables, it always looks crazy. Yeah. <laughs> then uh, volleyball, we're just at SEC here. Same type of thing, except uh, we're in the middle. So this is pretty much like it is at our home, except that it's not, we don't have a fancy stand. Um, this kind of gives you a view, though, of our wide camera, our two tight cameras at each end, each corner, and then we just have a small Marshall camera as like a, a super wide shot. So um, this is our football. I know each press box is really tight. Up top here are two consecutive camera bays. So there's actually a wall between these, or, or, or press box bays. There's literally a wall right here. So we put our cam commentators, scoreboard operator, Mirecast here. It's not the best because actually our scoreboard is way over there. So this person really kind of has to hang out the window to see it. Um, and then in the second room over here, we, this is our football coach. Sometimes there's actually two of them there. And then we have our, our two cameras. We try to always put camera one closest to half court or closest to midfield. And then just to the right here on this table is our switcher. You can see here, this is our comms again. The way we handle this is that just it's one SDI cable all the way back to the computer. So even a lot of times we have a nice setup when we're right next to each other, but then there's other games where we're really kind of spread out. So I kind of try to see if you had any questions. Do you go back one slide? Yeah. Um, have you have you explored anything about since you have two separate rooms, which is I know quite different than most people have. Yep. Have you explored anything about uh, wiring in the walls some HDMI ports so that instead of stringing cable through the rooms or outside of the rooms, you could actually just plug yeah. in the wall so up here and it's coming in the it other. It probably room. wouldn't be that bad of an idea. Right now, it's just mo actually just HDMI or SDI cables right through here, and that's the hardest. And then it's just about one cable on the ground right now. Except, I guess, if we want to bring in comms from the commentators, so well, we try to bring in our commentating audio into our crew communication. So that's also another cable that's on the ground across. But again, I'm hoping that this could be a good resource for you yes. as you start to think about how you want to set up your gyms. Someone put the lights. Um, we already already got an email from someone online asking for the slides. Yep. So this conversation is going to happen in the open field. That's our streaming space. So we're trying to separate all the different things that we do into the correct, have the conversations in the right places. So if you want to share the slides in the open field, then we'll probably email them out too. There's just a Canva link, I'm assuming. Yeah, I can give you the Canva link. The PDF, I can give you two. Okay. Uh, PDF's pretty big, it's like 50 megs because there's all the photos. Yeah, let's start with the Canva link and then they can download it if they want. More questions though, go ahead and then Eric's up. Yes. I just wanted to know more about your switcher. So we use, uh, I'll show you if I go back, you can actually see it in the rack. It's actually on top here. It's like a two-thirds rack size. That's the Blackmagic A10 Television Studio HD. They don't actually sell that exact model anymore. You probably can find that one online, though. The reason why we like this is that it works really great for us. It has four HDMI inputs and four STI inputs. And so at the time when we first bought it, we were kind of in a mixture of we use a lot of HDMI for a lot of stuff. But then, like, we were still traveling for like, ECNC and Udicus. Those ones we used SCI. So I wanted a switcher with both. We actually started with uh, Television Studio, I think is what it was called. It was, it was a rack mount with no buttons, no nothing. Um, and that was the same format for HDMI for SCI. So we were always able to do both. So we wanted to do that. Now, we don't use these buttons on the front except for small concerts. For a small concert, we will just use this and they can operate the switcher straight on the rack, on this. Most of the time, we sort of bring the laptop and they use a laptop to run the switcher. So that's, uh, with it's a separate, uh, mm -hmm. with Ethernet. Um, so yeah, on the back of this is the Ethernet port and then we put the Ethernet to the laptop. 
So, yeah, so this is similar actually to the mini, the, or what was that what they called? A10 minis? Well, the A10 mini Pro would have four but, HDMI. But if you just think about it in terms of the buttons on the front, and then yeah. it's, it's similar to that, except it's not rack mount. This is rack mount. Right. Yes? If you're a school that struggles with student involvement, what advice would you give for trying to keep them engaged in the broadcast and live stream? So like, you, we struggle with that as well, too, because a lot of the kids that we're getting um, you know, we have the kids that are in every activity, and then you have these kids, some kids that are in no activities, that don't have any of the parental support. They don't understand that, like, you're not going to not go to a basketball game because, like, if you're a basketball player, I'm not going to go to a basketball game because I have to work, right? I'm going to go because I'm part of the team, I need to be there for a basketball game, right? But for some of our students, it's hard that I've never had any team activity like that to know. No, you're scheduled to be on Strive. If you don't show up there, especially for the way we're set up, if one person doesn't show up, two other people might not have a job because it needs three people in line, right? So um, we still struggle with that, is the caveat I have for that. Uh, over the years, though, getting a headset on every kid for this group communication was the number one way to keep them involved in the stream. Um, and I felt like if you rotated them through so everyone could see what the live switching was like, and if they were running a tight camera, running those two jobs also kept them more engaged. Because like, for example, what Hoosier's doing right now is probably similar to the wide camera basketball, and it can be kind of boring, right? Because you're just following the action, you're not. I mean, yes, it's a really important job, and we actually talked about how that camera needs to be doing a lot of subtle things, but if they're doing those other jobs and they're talking with people, that's like probably our number one way to make the stream engaging. And then that helps with them, this overall, on the engagement with, with the events. Is by making the event seem like a big deal, seem like they're making, yeah, they're doing good work that is important. What do you do when kids don't show? So, it depends. So if we can, we pull people from the crowd. And um, this is where it, it's nice, and it, but it also hurts us. We're in a different town than our middle school is, so we're not able to pull middle school kids. But the middle school kids who do show up, we will pull them. Sometimes, it, I mean, we've had teachers that will fill in or run a camera. Um, our principal and our superintendent have both ran a camera before. So uh, a lot of times we pull people in if we need to. Um, now I know that everybody is going to be willing to do that. Um, like, is it so? Is this a, it's a class. It's a, cla it's so a class. So they get zero of your kids. There's a class. It's a class, and they have grades associated with that. And that was part of our deal: was how do we convince kids that they need to show up? From what? From we now that two years. I'm not sure putting a grade on it has made a difference at all. Because the kids who still show up will show up. The kids who won't. They won't. And then it kind of hurts you because if they're getting a zero for not showing up, and then it might be their stride class that they're in the middle of the one. So the way we also organize it is that if it, if whatever job they're doing is as part of a grade, they can still do it if they're ineligible. Now I make a judgment call on whether or not I actually may have them do that or not. I've had, a, like for example, I had a kid who was like in that scenario. I told them, you have you have showed up at all for stuff, you have to show up, but well, then you're just gonna get study time. So that's what I did. I made them show up and then they work on their other stuff. Yeah. Um, I kind of know the answer to this, but I want to make sure that it's on the stream and everything. You've been really fortunate, you've had some really good admins over your years that have really supported your ideas. Talk about your kind of workflow and how you work back and forth with your admins because I know it's it's different different size schools have it differently so uh that is through your experience well uh, I can start at the beginning we were really fortunate because the same summer our superintendent our uh, uh, athletic director and I all found Shrive all separately and we all thought it was a good idea all of it happening the same within the same like couple months span for like um, but it's making sure everybody is on board of why we're doing this because it goes back to all the stuff that Strive always talks about is education. It's about 
uh, being able to brand your school. It's about uh, getting your uh, events out to the grandparents, to family members that aren't in the district. It's all that stuff, and that's it's not. We're not doing this to make money. We're not doing this because we feel pressure to put stuff. I mean, yeah, we're not. Yeah, this should be an educational thing that's good for our school, that's good for our patrons, that's good for our viewers. Um, we worked together for up until we got Hello Focus cameras. We ran, we reported our um, separately on our cameras while we streamed for Hello. So we talked to our coaches about why we stream, you know, why it should be good for them to let us stream their games because you know different coaches have different ideas about that. Um, I don't know, is there anything specific you want to get? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, it, it's been it's been good. We've had we've had good admins that are are willing to allow uh, allow some different things. You guys do yeah. what 60, 70 events throughout the school year too. Yeah. So um, I make sure we actually talk about like um, some of the common concerns about streaming. Is it going to take away gate? Well, no. We looked at the numbers. If anything, our first three years of Strange Drive, our gate went up because you had people who were starting to watch. And they saw we had good teams that year, got people fired up, and by the end of the year, our, we were having pretty good crowds. And so I, they, we, we had the conversations ahead of time, and then they saw the literal results of that happening, that it can help um, build the brand and help get other people, uh, you know, because if you don't have people coming in the building, that's a good way to get them in their foot in. We don't put up our recordings, but um, that could change in the future because that was one of the things we I had a discussion with our coaches on of what we should, can and can't do and what we would be showing people and stuff like that. And, um, originally, we came up with a plan. We were not going to put games on, on on demand. Now, our tournament games are all on YouTube. Those are our big ones, our tournament games. So, And, I mean, everybody has huddle nowadays, so we might. Um, the other reason why, though not athletic director-wise, but for our kids is that um, by not putting every single game online, we talked, because we talked about like Strive and, and school in general being a safe spot to fail, is I don't want a two second mistake to be on the internet for someone to find to then use against a kid. To that point, we have put some of our recordings just unlisted on YouTube so that kids can go back and watch it. Um, but you're right, it's not out there for the public to just stumble across. Because while I'm pretty active in terms of making sure I'm hearing something, you know, you never know if something comes through. Like, like for, for example, the, one, the biggest issue we've ever had with any stream was that we got a call from another admin from an opposing school who was saying that uh, the kid was cussing on our stream. And that was during a football game, and so I was on a headset the whole time, and I'm like, I have no idea what they're talking about. And they, I, we got the call during the game, and I'm like, at first, the first thing I did was I talked to our kids, and I was telling them, um, oh, you know, for sure we're just not cussing or anything, because because I'm like, well, maybe I missed it, but then we talked about it, and because they never said, we never got a report of what they said. We found out what was happening. Um, we had a kid who, his lap, he was going through some stuff and his last name had changed. So like, I mean, I can't tell the story without saying the name, but like, uh, this kid's name was Philip, and he had a different last name, but now he was going to his mom's name, that was Buck. And so his name, like that was his name. But he was, he calls himself Phil, and then so the other commentators were calling him Phil, and they were doing the intro, and they were just smushing together his first and last name. Uh, and that's what was. Whoops. Comments. And, and. So, to watch, watch, also watch your audio to go with that one too. Uh, watch, we have a lot of times put a crowd mic for like crowd ambient noises. Be, be careful where you put yeah. the crowd mic. Because we have some wonderful guys in basketball, they're passionate, but sometimes they, we've got a phone call from the crowd that said something and our mic has picked it up. And then they said, we don't think it's your announcers, we think it came from the crowd. We're like, yep. Yeah, okay. We did that sometimes. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. They've been very good, but like, watch your crowd mics and mics. There are people that just won't sit in front of us. <laughs> yeah. um, I was going to ask, you said you did about like 60 to 70 events, which is a lot. Yeah. How do you prevent burnout in yourself and also in your students? 
Um, well, so this year was the first year I did it. I'm not sure I like it. Um, I helped design like our schedule poster, so I have all the, the raw data easily available. I made a Google Sheet showing every single event off the bat because a lot of the problems I get is the kid I'll will be like, here's the month schedule, and then the kid will be like, why well, a work schedule? I'm like, this game has been out of books, you know, since August, and you, I mean, so I was like, well, here, here's the whole pearl whole blooming thing. I think that was probably a bad decision. I'm probably not going to do it again. Uh, looks overwhelming. Um, you do work a semester at a time, and that's not too bad. I tell them, though, you, got, you just got to look at the schedule. Yes, there might be weeks that you do two or three games, but then, like, you might go two weeks without anything. Um, so, so you let them sign up, or do you assign them? I used to. I would try signing up. The, that was bad. <laughs> we, that, because, <laughs> yeah, um, they just wouldn't follow through. Uh, the problem is sometimes we have, like, ten people, and I might, depending on what you're doing, your stream might have room for six. So then you're trying to juggle people. But the problem is, is if I only have six sign up, and then only five of them actually show up, and then I'm short versus just telling them all the time. So, but like we do make sure we accommodate people who are in other events that we say, uh, well, this kid's in wrestling, so he gets to do the boys game because he can't be there for the girl game. So, I don't have a good answer. <laughs> yeah. Hey. I kind of jump in a little bit on that. Like my biggest payoff for my kids is going to state basketball. I think mm -hmm. and hyped that up all year, and then you know basically that's what I told my admin. Even if I'm not working, like this doesn't have to be everybody. But we're gonna go out and spend the whole day in Lincoln, and I'm gonna take them out to eat. And you're gonna pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> but like kids love that. And then you know when they got their check from working, like, they thought that was the coolest thing ever. And then, Kids that, that didn't go because they're like, well, I don't want to do that. Then they were jealous of that whole situation. Nice. So that's the last couple of years really helped. With. This is why you're putting in the time mm -hmm. to get that payoff. You know, you can't pay yeah. you to show up every game. Yeah. Let's pay you back off of that. I really agree. So our state tournament or our uh, conference tournaments are also good too. So like, but yeah, if you can get you get a foot in the door conference wise. So as part of your class, do you require students to work a certain number of events? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How many? How many do you? They basically it's basically everything, unless they have a conflict. <laughs> <laughs> I owe you sixty-five. <laughs> That's the number. <laughs> I do ten for the first semester. Okay. okay. For the second, based on the kids and events we have. But. Sixty is something can be deceiving because like that might be the JV varsity girls varsity boys varsity night. So the, the question I always hate is how many games is it? Well, it doesn't really matter. You're going to be there the same amount of time because they split up a game. You know, there might be two quarters of JV girls and four quarters of JV boys, and so it's four games. But you know, two games could take longer than four. You know, I like to say you're going to be here from this time to this time. Take away the games. Because like, like, two state games is a lot different than two uh, varsity basketball games at home. Like your girls and boys double headers are nothing like doing two quarterfinal games at state. That would probably take a lot more out of you. I, I agree that the hardest time is getting help, but we have mobile serve for. Seniors have to have like 40 hours of community service, mm -hmm. yes. so they're able to use mobile serve and put put service hours down, which helps helps me get some help here and there. Who else? Who? What other schools have not mo use mobile serve, but they have to require really community service? Yep. I get a lot of kids. I get some kids that have community service. Yeah. Now the, the hard part is that like we do excuse people if they have legitimate reasons. The biggest problem for me is if I think they're showing up, but they don't show. Which, depending on the group we have, sometimes the group, the group does a good job of just helping pressure the kids to make sure they show up. A little bit more about equipment. The, the cameras that you use for your stream, do you use, use those to shoot commercials as well and other projects? Yep, yep. So, like, that's part that I did really include here because, like, you can get the ones you shoot 4K 30 frames a second versus 60 or 120 frames a second, slow mo stuff, and, like, there's a lot of that. But, like, SD cards. I mean, if your camera's not shooting on SD cards, 
I'm not sure. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Like, you might be getting into different things that you don't need to. Um, if you're even if even if you're shooting for vertical content, I'd still say you should film horizontally because then you can still put it on YouTube and then crop in a vertical um, for your social. Well, the one thing that's helped us is not having somebody run the clock. We actually yeah. put a camera on the clock and yeah. prop it into our scoreboard so we don't have, this, that's really a one-man operation, trying to run the clock for so, basketball. So when we're in our basketball jam, we have a bug that's automatic. But we need to know RCS for football. If we go to any away games, we need to know how to run that. So this, like um, normally for the first like, volleyball game of the year, We'll probably make, I try to make them all use it once. So. I would bring up yeah, my, my question on like integrated score vision. That's, that's what I was going to ask. Is there an integration for no to Strive? No, no, yet. no not yet. They they're pretty proprietary right now. So so we have we have the four camera switcher, and then I've been using the Black Magic box to run my fifth camera on the scoreboard. Yeah. But my tech guy wants to give me a new computer that has USB C, so I guess I need to talk to somebody about the configuration for yep, sure. trying to get that fifth camera in. I don't know. That's in the black polo. Yeah, so like if we've done it on the road too, or us and a second capture card, is that what we're talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A second one? Yeah. And then, yeah, you, you could do some fancy stuff with Wirecast to make it look kind of cool. Like you can take the color away, you can try to chrome key it out. This is my last question. Yeah. <laughs> what is your favorite sport to, to uh, live stream? Um, it depends on the circumstance. Uh, if you could do um, three, at least three cameras on volleyball, uh, like on a five set match, but we don't see a lot of five set matches. Um, because nowadays we get a lot of uh, triangular stuff, so with all three set matches. Volleyball can be pretty awesome, but um, Football, you have a ton of variety of what can happen. You have outdoor light, which makes it really interesting. So one of the advantages of, all, of these cameras is it's a lot easier to control our exposure because like going from a DSLR that I shoot like photos on or if you shoot video on there, that's super easy to change exposure because that's what they're made for, right? Well, video cameras are trying to make this easy for you on exposure, but then when it comes to like as the sun's setting and your white balance is changing all that stuff, that's a lot to change. The difference between the HF G40s or even the G70s versus this is that this is literally like one button and I'm already modifying that thing, modifying that field. Versus like on those cameras, you'll have to hit menu, then white balance, and then choose it. On ours, you can just hit white balance and then you can use a joystick to move it right away. So like um, football gives you the opportunity to be more creative on that. Basketball, you're never really changing exposure or white balance. You're setting it for you. Uh, but in terms of uh, basketball, can be also really it's, it's simplified. Your, your set like every gym is pretty much the same, right? It's the same length. It's bat, the hoops are the same height. You know, like football has a lot more variety, so like that's good. But then when you get to basketball, I don't know. I, I don't know. All of them are all of them are are fun. I don't know. Probably football because you can have more. You have more time to be unique on your broadcast. And he can't say golf because he hasn't come to the York golf thing yet. <laughs>